everyone. So I think it's time to share my screen and today we are going to discuss a very important subject or at least the subject that I consider to be really important and uh, I hope by the end of my presentation I will um, make sure that you will consider it the same. So it's about technical debt. Um, thank you very much for attending this presentation. Thank you very much for joining our conference. I really hope that you already uh, enjoyed uh, the uh, discussions of yesterday and today. Uh, and of course, I hope that you will enjoy our discussion as well, um, which is, by the way, named Technical Depth, a guide for developers and IT managers. So um, what about this? What, what do we want to say about this? Um, one second, because I think my screen is not responding for some reason. Okay, now it is. So what, what do we want to say about this? Uh, of course, a little bit of words about me just to skip over. I, I know you are not here for me, but for the for the presentation. So uh, I'm Laurent. You can find me uh, almost every, everywhere on social media. Uh, and uh, please do follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, and uh, also enjoy my uh, my books. Most people know, know me for my books and for my YouTube channel. But uh, again, it's not probably the, the reason you came here. Let's discuss technical debt. Technical debt is a very important subject. Uh, most people, uh, most developers, IT managers, uh, users, uh, when, when I say people from the software world, I, I mean everyone, not only the developers, architects, and those who build the software, but also those who manage it and those who use it, uh, they tend to see the technical debt uh, as uh, some kind of a disease. And uh, I pretty much like to compare technical debt to, uh, for example, um, uh, cholesterol on, on your arteries. You will see that. Uh, technical debt has this uh, unfortunate way of spreading quietly. Uh, and in the end, if, if we allow it to exist, it will rise up to a point where you can't come back, where you, where you can't treat it anymore. Um, but at the same time, I will teach you today that technical debt can also be seen from an economic point of view. And instead of considering it only a sickness, of the software system, you can actually um, benefit of it. And uh, I, I will show you exactly how and in which situation and how exactly can you take advantage of technical debt. And, and in general, people, when they hear about taking, taking advantage of technical debt, um, they uh, respond uh, in a negative way because they, they again see technical debt as some, something bad, especially if you are developers with plenty of experience. Uh, you, you already know that technical debt is not something good in the end, but you can make it good. Now, uh, the, the reason uh, people don't uh, like technical debt is because uh, it, it grows continuously in software. Even in a piece of software that doesn't change at all, technical debt grows. And when, when I say that, usually people uh, ask me, uh, how is that possible? I mean, if you don't change the software, the technical debt grows. Uh, yes, the technical debt grows even if you don't change a line of code. Why? Because uh, technology changes, uh, improves. Uh, in the Java world, for example, tomorrow, uh, not tomorrow, of course, this, this month, already we will step into Spring Boot 3. Uh, we already stepped into Java 19. Next year, we will have Java 21, which is the latest long-term supported, the next latest long-term supported. Uh, so what, if you have a piece of code that is Java 17 now, and you don't change it, it will become a legacy and it will we can consider that as technical debt growing inside it. So you see, you continuously need to address technical debt. And that's why you need to build a strategy where technical debt is always on your table. Of course, that doesn't mean you only have to spend your time on te solving technical debt, but it always has to be on your table and correctly prioritized. Another uh, thing about technical debt is that it's silent. That means that it, it grows without uh, you noticing it. And if you, you, if you are not a good manager or developer and you don't consider technical debt, uh, it grows in a way that is more like exponentially, meaning that you don't see it, you don't see it, you don't see it. And at, at some point you see it's 
very fast growing and you very, very fast to reach the point where you can't come back. And we, we call that uh, the point of no return. Uh, and again, it becomes more and more dangerous with time. And the, the, the problem is that when, when you reach the point of no return, that means that uh, it's more profitable to rewrite the application than, than correct what you have and be, build over it. Uh, then it's it's a very big problem. And I will tell you some stories about this as well. And this is the first story that I want to discuss with you. It's about an Italian startup for which some years ago, not many years ago, I, um, I had to uh, uh, help them with consultancy. Uh, and uh, I will, of course, not, not give names of companies because I'm not allowed to, uh, but you can, you can trust me that it was, um, it was a very, in, I would say quite, uh, quite important startup, but it was uh, the, the software that they built was poorly managed from the very beginning. And um, uh, when I say poorly managed, I mean in terms of technical debt, of course, because that's the subject of our today's presentation. And what, what happened is that at the point, the, the moment when I had to uh, uh, discuss and then review their software, I had no choice than telling them that they, they reached the point of no return, that they can't come back. And of course, they didn't like, uh, they, they didn't like what they heard. Um, I, I, I even remember that uh, when, when I was discussing with this board of C executives, um the, the c level uh, uh, people managers in the organization uh and they they literally didn't like of course what what uh, what i was saying and they they quit me so they didn't didn't want to continue with me because they they considered that they want a second opinion of course that's very well that's that's uh, something uh, uh that uh, everyone should do at some point take a second opinion uh, but uh, again, my opinion was uh, was I, I was quite strong on it, and I was quite uh, uh, faithful that that I know what I'm saying. And uh, it turns out that about a year after that, they actually went bankrupt. Um, so that that it was in, indeed a point of no return, and they knew that they cannot afford the time and money to rewrite the software. And they of course tried to find the, uh, an initiative. To, to build over what they had and somehow correct it. But again, it was at the point of no return. So uh, they ended up, because they don't, didn't have the money to, to rewrite, they ended up uh, bankrupt. So that, that's what can happen if you are not attentive with technical debt. So this is basically what we call, again, technical bankruptcy, uh, meaning that, and I will now switch from, uh, let's say a more medical perspective analogy to a more economic perspective of what technical debt is, and we will discuss about technical debt in a, in, a, in a, an economic from an economic point of view, and that's why I call it technical bankruptcy because you at the point of no return, uh, you consider the software is technically bankrupt. That means it's like when you borrow too much money and you can't pay them back. Uh, then you are bankrupt. It's like uh, any one of us, and like like for example, any economy uh, that can uh, can go bankrupt. And you see what I was telling uh, a few minutes ago uh, is the exponential um, graphic that shows that the, the technical debt might not be visible at the very beginning, but then it's visible uh, at some point um, uh, very very quickly. And that of course it's one of the properties that makes it very. Um, very dangerous. Uh, of course, there will always be technical debts. One of the things that you have to consider is that technical debt is not something that you will bring to zero ever. So like in the case of cholesterol, you will always have that in your body. And the only thing you can do is make sure that you treat it accordingly. So then make sure that you consider it throughout your lifetime uh, and you correct it like you, you eat something healthy, you take medication in case you need to take medication and stuff like that. Same is with the technical debt. So technical debt is not something that you will, you will get to read out of the software. So you will have at some point the zero technical debt level. That's something that doesn't exist. Uh, so instead of thinking about removing technical debt completely, what you should think about is actually uh, how do we continuously manage technical debt? So as a uh, product owner, as a development team, as a scrum master, as wh whatever you are part of your roles, you always have to consider uh, the, the idea of technical debt. 
uh, and always consider consider it as something that exists and will will never get to zero. So you will always have something to put on your plate to work on in regards to technical debt. And if if you don't do that, it means you don't treat technical debt. That uh, in the end will will lead to um, uh, probably to, to technical bankruptcy if you if you don't do that. Uh, now it's it's uncertain, and it really depends on the software, on the teams, on the way the software is managed and built when the technical bankruptcy will happen. It might happen in a couple of years. It might have happened in a few months. It might, it might happen in, in 20 years. So it, it's, it's not like it's something you, you can calculate when exactly it will happen because it, it really depends on many factors. But the idea is that it will happen at some point. So that's why you always have to measure the technical debt and consider it. So, but but always your philosophy should be uh, how do I manage it wisely? Now, okay, I, I already discussed plenty of time about how technical debt is bad and how you can put it uh, on, your, on your table and solve it every each and every sprint, consider it and so on and so forth. Let's talk about how can you actually at some point take advantage of technical debt because yes it's like you heard it's possible to take advantage of technical debt uh and it's it's called debt for a reason because it's literally like borrowing something what do you borrow when you have technical debt you actually borrow time so instead of iterating multiple times over a piece of software and make it look according to all the principles, make the objects decouple, the services decouple, uh, follow the principles, the solid principles and so on to, to have it extensible. Uh, uh, you borrow time because you don't have. So in the end, what happens is that you will pay that time with a debt but that can be useful so it sounds it might sound tricky but it's it's useful sometimes and imagine the following analogy so you want to buy a house the house of your dreams but unfortunately you realize you don't have the money to buy that house so what can you do well you figure out that you can loan some money from the bank and then you have enough money to buy the house is that wise of course it depends if it's wise or not and whenever you take a credit, probably most of you know, uh, whenever you borrow money from anyone, uh, either it's a bank or, or someone else, you have to be very careful with what you have to pay back because you will always have to pay back a little bit more than you loaned. So, but, but you can do that. And when, when you do that with, uh, with the bank to, for example, buy a house, what exactly do you buy? You buy with, with that, uh, uh, part of the money that you will pay back more, you buy the time because otherwise you would have to uh, spend years to put money apart and have them to buy the house, but don't want to, you, you want to have the money now and then benef benefit of your house. So that's that's the idea. What, what you want to do is to buy the house now, not in five years from now on or how many years you'd need to, to get all those money. And instead you prefer to pay a little bit more but but borrow the time okay so that's something that you can do with software as well and that's that's the thing that i i want to uh bring to your attention is that the same way of thinking as when you borrow money from a bank to you when you when you get a credit uh to to buy something uh is the same thing that you can do with software and again this comes with a different story and this second story uh is I call it hard to decommission. It was a very difficult project I had again some years ago, and not so many years ago, uh, where the client uh, who was for my consultancy was in the situation where they were paying uh, a licensed software which was built by someone else and was uh, only used by them, so that the software wasn't their property. You know that some uh, some software is created for uh, business purposes, but uh, the clients pay a license for that, okay? Uh, so the same, the same thing was with this one, but I'm not sure if you are aware, uh, we don't discuss here about, I don't know, IntelliJ or something like that. We discuss about software that costs a lot of money because it's, it's very particularly designed for a business. And it can cost from 
hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars per year. So it's not cheap at all. So that, that's why uh, when, when you have to pay such a license to use the software one more year, uh, you spend as a company, you spend as an organization, you spend a lot of money. And then, then what this customer of mine uh, wanted to do is to quit that software and build their own. Now, here's the problem. You have precisely one year to borrow a team and a very fixed budget because if they get over that deadline, which becomes a hard deadline, you will have to pay for both this software and one more license because you, you, you can't afford your teams to be, uh, your, your users to be in production standstill. So how can you do to have a hard deadline and implement, implement a minimum set of capabilities so that your users can use uh, in such a short time? You have a shorter time basically than what you would need to build that software. What you can do is borrow time, of course. So in this situation, what, what I advise my client is to on purpose introduce technical debt in their application with the condition of having them of having it solved afterwards. So what, what we did there is that we, from the very beginning, knew every technical debt that we introduced, but we introduced it with a good reason. We knew from the very beginning what we are doing. We knew that we, are, we were borrowing time and then that we will spend a little bit even more time to, to solve what we have. But this strategy, uh, allowed us to build our software. And we, we actually this way managed to uh, end with a minimal, minimal, minimal viable product at the deadline. And they managed to decommission their uh, third party software, uh, which in the end helped them saving a lot of money in the next couple of, of years or, or more. So this strategy, it was a very, very well, very good business approach that allowed them to, uh, uh, to be on track and in the end even uh, be uh, uh, profitable. So you can use technical debt to borrow time and you don't necessarily have to see technical debt as an evil thing, but you always have to follow some rules. And of course, rule number one is to know your debt, meaning know what you have there so always when we were, for example, borrowing time and we knew that we are doing something which was not the right way or not completely the right way, but we do it like this because we want to shorten the implementation time, we always added issues in our Jira board so we, we don't forget. So we remember that is technical debt that we left there on purpose. So after the deadline, we could take it and solve it in, a, in an appropriate way. That means you always have to know your technical debt. And then uh, because technical debt always exists, you should never take a break um, from solving things that are part of your technical debt in your backlog. That means when, whenever you have to build something, to put something in your backlog, you have to uh, put the features, the capabilities, the business use cases you want to implement, definitely. But at the same time, you have to always remember to put some technical debt there. So rule number two, from my point of view, will be never be tempted to leave technical debt apart. Because remember, same as in case of money borrowed from a bank, the more you leave them there, the more you pay um, uh, afterwards. So. Uh, always take it. Of course, you need to prioritize it. You don't, don't have to take things like just random, uh, but it's something that, that you always have to do. So rule number two, make sure that never you never leave debt. If you leave debt, make, make sure you do that on purpose and have a plan on how to solve that. Otherwise, if you don't have some strategic plan, like for example, we had, in the second story, uh, then, then have technical debt and solving technical debt, even if it doesn't bring uh, value, visible value to your users, it's very critical to uh, avoid uh, to, uh, um, to avoid getting to the point of no return. And then, of course, 
you always need to measure your depth and know where you are. So are you on the right track? That means uh, are you uh, solving enough? Is the technical depth growing more than what you managed to solve? Is it going on a descendant graphic? That, that these are things that are very important to measure and know. So you have to, for example, measure the technique that the new depth, you always have to know what you put in there. Uh, you put in there and you leave in there, you leave it there only on purpose. So you, you have to uh, solve it during the sprint or the sprints. And whenever you leave technical depth, always have it calculated with uh, the with having in mind that you will you will pay for it later don't postpone too much technical debt and take account of urgency so make sure that all the technical debt you have is uh, labeled with how important and how urgent that technical debt is and depending on that you will of course be able to manage your urgency and importance and make sure that you have all the urgent and important sold first or the, all the important but not urgent solved uh, second, and only then you solve the urgent but not important and uh, the not urgent and important. Uh, and you you might know already the separation of uh, of having uh, things urgent and important is not something that we only use in software. It's something that we use uh, in general. Um, so uh, story number three. Uh, is about what to avoid, however, in uh, technical debt. Don't get into a technical debt OCD. That can happen as well. So what is a technical debt OCD is when you basically try to solve too much technical debt. And I, I saw that as well. At some point, uh, I, I came to, to consult a, a team of developers who were um, from the perspective of, of the management they were they were building very slow the capabilities and usually as a software developer when i hear the management saying that developers build slow i tend to to actually uh, be on the side of the developers because i'm a developer myself and i know that i am very often uh, it, it happens to be pushed on implementing something and especially when I when I have to deal with non software managers because they don't really understand software, uh, they, they tend to be very pushy. So I, I gave, of course, the first chance to the team of developers. Now, of course, uh, in this, this story, I did discover that it was a problem with how the team of developers was managing their tasks. So it, it was, uh, let's say that, that the management had indeed uh, they, they were right on on one hand uh they weren't totally wrong we could do something and the idea was at, the, at that time that that uh, uh some of the people in the teams they were really uh ocd about how they build the software so they, they literally spent a lot of time polishing or golden plating silver plating there are, there are a lot of terms used in management for this so they, they actually spent a lot of iterations over a specific capability. Now, this is not bad, but the, the way this works is that, again, when, when you, uh, uh, when you um, uh, work with technical depth and try to solve it, the graphic is also going the, uh, quite the same way. So at some point, you work, but you don't benefit a lot out of it. So you have to polish the software up to the point where you get a lot of benefit from polishing it. Then if you if you spend three days thinking at, I don't know, the name of a variable, uh, the name of a method, how do we name this service and so on and so forth, maybe it's not that good in that end. We can, we can have other strategies. We can just put whatever name is there and then you treat it later when you have a, a better idea you treat it later uh, by applying the boy scout rule which means that when you have to work on software if you see something that you can improve even if it's not yours you improve it that's the boy scout rule so that's that's instead of having to polish basically uh whatever you uh, uh build uh, instead of 
having to stay, let's say, three days on a capability, uh, in which can be very well solved in one day and a half or two, then you uh, spend only the time to, to, to solve it well, but you don't then spend time to polish the functionality if that polishing doesn't bring you um, uh, that doesn't bring you a, a good advantage. Uh, otherwise, you will fall in the other direction where you invest more time, uh, then you uh, you benefit out of it. So that's that's of course bad. Bad in terms of not being profitable enough because software, like any other thing, it's something that needs to be profitable. So a good software development team is not necessarily the one that creates software, that creates perfect software, even though anyway, perfect software doesn't exist anyway. It's not, not something that, 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 that exists. Um, but uh, even if it, it would exist, then it doesn't help, uh, it doesn't necessarily help to get there. Uh, the, the best development team is the one that creates the software at its highest profitable um, point on the graphic. And that's not necessarily perfect software. Uh, in terms of tools, I have some advice for you. Uh, it's never trust only one tool. So when, whenever you choose your tools in, in which, uh, which you want to, to use, is uh, like let's say I, I use uh, um, I use the unit tests uh, and I, I count my coverage very well. Uh, I uh, I use Jacoco or I use some some tool that creates graphics. I use uh, tools that uh, statically analyze my code. Um, what what whatever I choose, uh, use more tools and try to differentiate between them. For example. Choosing a rule of, I want to have 80% unit test coverage, it's not necessarily a good rule, okay? Imposing a percentage, a, a, an up percentage of, uh, of, of uh, integration and unit test coverage is not necessarily good. Uh, you have to really well think about what you do there and use your tools correctly uh, when, you, when you measure your technical debt. Of course, if you don't do that, you might uh, end up having a less profit, less profitable software than you would uh, expect. Now, the conclusions from my side, and uh, I think that's that's everything uh, we will end with, uh, is technical debt is dangerous, but it's dangerous only if it's not managed the right way. There is always technical debt there, and you can use the technical debt as a tool to improve the profitability of your software instead of always thinking about it as an illness. Uh, it's like borrowing money from the bank. When you borrow money from the bank, you borrow times, so that's it. Uh, you always have to measure technical debt, uh, but never use only one tool and make sure that you use all the tools in the right way. Uh, always solve debt in every sprint. Remember that postponing debt uh, postponing debt will, will come even more expensive afterwards. And of course, don't forget about the urgency and importance. Always make sure that you solve the most uh, important first uh, and that you always in your uh, board have a good priority on what means important, what means urgent in terms of technical debt. Uh, and I think guys, with that being said, we are at the end of our presentation. Uh, and I don't see a lot of questions from your side. Uh, are out of date like, okay, I see a question now. Fine, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, so are out of date libraries technical debt? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say they are necessary technical debt, uh, but they, they, uh, they can become technical debt. Uh, for example, uh, if you, uh, if you have a, a, a library or a framework and you don't plan in time to upgrade it, you will find it more difficult later to upgrade it for, for certain. So for example, now Spring 3 will be out there soon. 
What I will do is very quickly, I will upgrade my Spring Boot 2.0 application to Spring Boot 3. I know that if I won't do that quick, uh, afterwards it will be more difficult. Uh, but at the same time, what I want you to know is that you shouldn't um, you shouldn't uh, uh, also just put everything new in your application up front if you don't know very well what you do, because otherwise you can introduce actually technical depth by, by that action. And then you, we have uh, how to handle a technical debt that impacts a database. Well, I, I do handle a technical debt at the system level. I'm not sure if there is any other specific way in which you have to handle technical debt at database level. I, I just see it as application level, whether it's the database, the continuous integration and development pipelines, the front end, uh, everything it's application and I think you should handle all the technical that all of it so it's, a, it's no different way in which you have to think about technical that a specific uh, part of the application because all the parts of the application they form your system so they are important what kind of arguments can we put on table to a non-technical manager to a low budget for addressing technical debt I, I for a long time I uh, 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 quit it uh, bringing arguments. Well, I, of course, do bring arguments. And uh, it's, it's like, for example, if you go to a doctor and they say you have a lot of cholesterol, you shouldn't, you shouldn't eat uh, fat and, uh, and drink Coca-Cola. And then, then you do that. It's not the doctor's fault. Uh, I, I do tell them that if, if they don't listen to me, then I will, I will just anyway plan the software myself. Because usually if they are non-technical, they anyway don't understand what's behind the scenes there. So if I, I, I do plan my, my technical debt, they don't even know that I do, I'm doing that. <laughs> so that, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm not sure if it's the, the moral way of doing that, but it works very well for me. Uh, uh, Tristan, I, I must stop you for a minute here because uh, we must remind people that we have uh, these three prizes for the questions. So the most interesting questions for Laurentiu will uh, get a prize. So we're waiting for all the questions. Okay, guys, if no other questions, then I think we can conclude. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing you at other events as well. Very happy that you, you are here with me. Don't forget to follow me on social media. And uh, until next time we meet, have an excellent time for study further. Cheers, wait, guys. Wait, wait, wait. We do have questions for you. <laughs> we do have other questions. Yeah. Because I don't see them in the chat. Um, we have one from Emil Moise. Yeah, I already answered that one. You already answered. Okay, sorry, I missed that. I will ask uh, one more question from here. Um, what is the limit after which the complete rebuilding of an application is cheaper than addressing the technical debt? So, so uh, what is the limit? Um, can, can you repeat it, please? What is the limit after which the complete rewriting of the application is cheaper than addressing the technical uh, debt? That, that's, that's, called the, that's called the point of no return. It's, it's not something that you can say without really well uh, analyzing the software. So when I'm, when I'm uh, called by someone and they ask me to, to tell them about how their software look like and if it reached or not the, the point of no return it takes me many days and maybe weeks to go throughout the whole software and their processes understand what's there and then come with a, with a conclusion so it's, it's not not some answer that i can give you a, a mathematical formula and you can apply it and then you will uh, you will find the, the solution and what i do is based on my a lot of years of experience Okay, thank you very much, Laurentiu. You will have to uh, decide which of the questions deserves a prize <laughs> and uh, let us know.
and uh, everybody we are taking uh, a break until uh, so one o'clock. second uh, one second Dan, because I, I see one more yeah. question i want to answer so are there any metrics to measure yeah. the technical okay. depth yes of course you can you can measure technical depth in in many ways you can uh, take account of uh, the libraries and the versions that you have to upgrade and put them on a list you can use uh, sonar or a different software similar software to uh, static analyze your code and see what doesn't what doesn't fulfill to the rules of code smells uh you can uh ask a consultant or have a consultant in your team to analyze the code uh in uh, finding uh, anti-patterns or uh, stuff like that uh you can um uh yeah in general that's that's basically how how you do that i'm not, i'm not sure if i i missed something static analysis uh someone analyzing it having the versions in place generally like like that it's uh, can the proficiency of the developers be considered as a technical depth no 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 technical depth in my perspective is something related to uh specifically the software uh, the proficiency of the developers may lead to uh, lack of uh, quality which means they could increase the technical depth but technical depth itself it's not in the development team but in the software it is a result of the developers work okay cool i think that's it and yeah, thank you very much and thank, thank you. you people for asking questions uh, we are taking the break now and see you at five o'clock cheers everyone